My name is Alexander Sokol. Uh, uh, this is the introduction to mathematical finance course presented by Comparable. Uh, today's lecture, you know, last, uh, you know, fourth and final lecture of the course, uh, and uh, we'll talk about asset classes. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we will, uh, uh, you know, asset classes, um, uh, you know, financial instruments are organized by asset class. And asset class is sometimes defined based on how the investors receive proceeds from the instrument or the payoff of the instrument. And sometimes by what drives them out of this proceeds, right? For example, the primary risk driver. The asset classes we'll review today are equity, stocks and derivatives whose payoff is based on stock prices, foreign exchange, uh, trades whose payoff is based on foreign exchange rates, uh, interest rates, namely interest bearing deposits and derivatives based on the interest rates uh, based by these deposits, fixed income, bonds and derivatives based on bond prices, and credit. Uh, various forms of uh, uh, insurance against company default packaged as a financial instrument. We we'll also talk about commodity, that will be our final asset class, uh, that's a single asset class, namely standardized uh, contracts to deliver commodities and derivatives based on prices of these standardized deliveries. And finally, hybrids. Uh, hybrids is a special catch-all uh, catch uh, class for derivatives that include elements of more than one asset class or cannot be cleanly slotted into one of these asset class categories, right? So for this assets uh, or derivatives that uh, go across multiple asset classes, there is a special asset class called hybrid. So today, uh, this is of course a very brief uh, overview uh, and generally we try to compress, uh, you know, the mathematical finance programs usually go for a year, sometimes for multiple years. So we try to introduce you to mathematical finance over the course of four lectures. So today, uh, you know, we normally would have uh, in a you know full year mathematical finance course. We'll have a few we would have a few lectures for each asset class. But today we try in one lecture in 90 minutes introduce you to one asset class. Sorry, one instrument, one financial instrument from each asset class. All right. So let's start from equity. All right. So Equity, uh, and uh, when we talk about equity, we will discuss something that will have be a recurring theme uh, throughout the lecture of how financial markets help you edit or change to your desire the probability distribution of your investments. In this case, if it's equity, it's stock market investments. And we'll discuss how to do it using options. So generally, derivatives uh, can be used to edit the probability distribution uh, of trading strategy profits to, to meet uh, the investor's goals. So equity is the primary tool of this editing is option strategies, namely buying and selling a group of options all at the same time or at predefined times. Because equity options are traded on exchanges, assembling a strategy from exchange trading traded call and put options offers lower cost and better liquidity compared to customized OTC contracts. And uh, one note, you know, the aside, uh, for foreign exchange that we will be discussing next. So today is, you know, right now uh, we're discussing equity. So, uh, you know, in 10 minutes we'll be discussing foreign exchange. So foreign exchange, the opposite is true. So because currencies are not traded on exchanges, FX options uh, with more complex payment functions or payoff functions, for example, there is something called digital option, there's something called no-touch option. Uh, they're preferred by traders to option strategies. So the reason in equities, uh, traders prefer option strategies, namely multiple simpler options, as opposed to single more complex option, is because the simpler options in case of equity are traded on exchanges, and it's easier to assemble your strategy from exchange traded options, which are cheaper to buy and sell, they're more transparent, more reliable, than from a single more complex bespoke contract that you uh, trade with someone, uh, or just more complex financial instrument that you take again over the counter with someone. But foreign exchange is not traded, uh, you know, FX, uh, Forex options uh, are not traded on exchanges, and uh, well, generally Forex instruments, uh, it's a different type of market. And because it's a different type of market and uh, you know, there are no like simple exchange traded instrument that are standardized by the exchange, uh, the market evolved toward achieving the same goal, but instead of multiple simpler instruments, 
in foreign exchange, it's more typically achieved with a single more complex entropy. All right, so uh, we will discuss how it's possible to trade your view on the volatility as opposed to the stock price. So financial markets make it possible for traders expect the view, uh, express the view on where the stock price would go in a very simple way. You can buy if you think the stock price will go up, you can sell or sell short, maybe sell the stock you don't have, but you know you make an obligation to get it later you normally borrow it from someone temporarily and then eventually you buy it and uh, deliver. So um, uh, so you know sell uh, buy you know buy if you if you think the price will go up, you buy. If you think the price will go down, you sell or sell short. So this way you can express your view of where the stock price would go through your investment and profit if you're right and lose money if you're wrong. But what if you or the trader, you know, the trader have the view on the direction of volatility as opposed to stock price, right? So stock price is the price, volatility or daily vol. So, you know, volatility is abbreviated to vol in financial markets. Uh, daily vol is the standard deviation of a daily move in the stock price. And you may not know or not have a view of where the stock price will go, but you think that the volatility will increase. For example, right now is the quiet times. You expect some turmoil ahead for the industry. You know, perhaps uh, the regulators decided to, uh, you know, get involved in the industry or some events are happening that may increase the stock price, may decrease the stock price. You don't know, but you know that the stock price will definitely move, right? So you may have a view about the volatility when you don't have a view about the stock price. So if you have such a view, you can express the view using the straddle strategy. And the straddle strategy involves buying or selling, uh, sorry, well, buying both call and put option or selling both call, 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 call and put option on the same stock with the same strike or the same expiration date, right? So let's talk about buying a straddle. So buying a straddle involves buying call and put options on the same underlying stock with the same strike in the same expiration date. Right, so at first sight, buying both call and put options seems contradictory, right? Because call option is a bet that the price will go up, put option is a bet that the price will go down. So why would you buy both of them at the same time? Well, the reason is that uh, if the stock price does not change and the straddle is held for a short period of time, the profit of the straddle depends on the change of wall. Because higher wall makes large price movements more likely, the straddle will increase in price if the wall increases. We'll see in a moment how this happens. So the straddle is a bet that the price will move more than a certain amount in any direction in the future. And this makes it a bet on the increase in wall. So let's take a look, right? So the dash line is the value of the investment and call, call option. In this investment, uh, we've seen in derivatives, we've already seen this uh, uh, payoff uh, profile. So it's flat or constant below the strike price. And then at linear, it's a uh, you know, price of the stock minus uh, a constant above the strike price. But something is a little bit different. Before, when we uh, you know talking about derivatives, we discussed, and generally, you, know, you may have seen us elsewhere, the stock option payoff is being zero below if it's a call option being zero below the strike and price of stock minus the strike above the strike right now this is a little bit different right this is shifted downward so the reason this is shifted downward here is because the payoff is zero below the strike but this is the value of your investment in the option and when you buy the option you buy the right that you may exercise or not exercise. And for someone to sell you this right, you have to pay money. So this negative amount here between zero and the dash line is the price of the option. So you invested in the option, you paid money, so you're out of pocket, right? So, so basically, uh, you know, it cost you money to buy this option. And if the option pays nothing, you will lose that money, right? It will expire worthless. You paid money for the option, but you did not use it. And if the stock price goes a little bit higher than the strike, you make a little bit of money by exercising the option, but not as much as the price. The stock has to go up by more than the price of the option 
before you make money from the investment, right? So you make money from the options. If you already have the option, maybe you received it as a gift, right? Somebody just say, well, you know, here, I give you an option, right? So then you would make money if the stock price is above the strike. But if you paid for it, then you make money not just when the stock price is above the strike, but it has to be significantly above by the price of the option, right? That's why it's actually negative here and it's positive here. Now, this dash line, the other dash line, is the put option, right? So same thing, but reversed. So uh, it's negative when the stock price is high and it becomes positive when it's low. When you add these two together, you get the solid line and there's a straddle. So the straddle loses money if the, if the stock remains the same as the strike price. And usually if you express the view on the wall, you would buy the straddle with the strike is the current stock price. Or if you, to be more precise, if you, uh, you could buy it for uh, the strike equal to what you think the stock price will most likely be, right? But let's assume it's today's strike price, stock price. So the straddle, which is a solid line, loses money if the stock price change, it changes a little bit. And it makes money if it changes a lot. The price of the option is the, and you know, we, we can, um, uh, if we are really being extremely careful in thinking about the market price of risk, uh, then you know, we can say not just the probability, but, but market implied probability, right? So we talked about it uh, on the last lecture. So you know, that's not what we're talking about today. So uh, market, you know, so I will not again uh, rehash, uh, you know, the difference between probability and market implied probability, but the market implied probability of stock uh, prices. If volatility is low, it's this line, right? So in other words, uh, large deviations are very unlikely and small deviations are very likely. And if this is the probability or market implied probability, uh, risk adjusted, you know, including basically probability that includes the market price of risk, right, to be very precise. If this is the probability of stock price at maturity, then you will lose money uh, on the straddle, right? Because, uh, you know, the, um, uh, uh, sorry, no, not lose money, I'm sorry. Then, then the, uh, you know, the payoff will be basically, uh, the options will more likely expire worthless than they would um, not. So the straddle will be very cheap if the vol initially is low. But if the vol increases, the probability of extreme deviations in stock price will be higher, right? So the stock price could go here or could go here in any direction, right? So in other words, we don't know where it will go, but if the wall is higher, we think that this is more likely, or the wall, higher wall rather means it's more likely it will go a lot higher or a lot lower. In this case, the probability of straddle paying off and uh, you know having positive value is higher. So if you are buying the straddle when the wall is low and you think that the wall will go high, then if you are right, you will be able to sell the straddle a little bit later, right? Don't wait until maturity. You buy it, let's say straddle for one year horizon, right? So maturity date of the straddle is one year from now. And you think that today vol is lower than it will be in one month. After one month, you think the vol will go up. By buying the straddle, you are making a almost pure bet on the vol direction because the straddle is, has sensitivity primarily to the wall, right? So if the wall increases between now and one month from now, the straddle price will go up. And this is how you can express your view on where the wall will go, even if you don't know if the stock price will go up and down, right? So if you buy the stock, then you essentially are sensitive to, you're sensitive to where the stock price will go. If you sell the stock, you're also sensitive, but the opposite direction. You don't want to be sensitive, right? You don't know where it will go. You don't just want to make a random bet if you're not sure if the stock price will go up and down. But you are sure, right? Or you know, you think vol will go up by the straddle, right? Because if you are right, the straddle will be worth more one month from now when the vol is higher than it is today, right? So that's how you can express your view using uh, an option strategy. And this is how you essentially you edit your investment profile, right? You started from two from stock, then you say, well, let's go to two options and they have their own profile. Now you combine them and you essentially edited the outcome of this investment for you to obtain your desired outcome. And your desired outcome is to make money if the vol goes, goes up 
And that's exactly what the strategy does. All right, so as before, uh, everybody is on mute, too many people for uh, you know an open discussion, but uh, if you have a question, please ask it in the chat and my colleagues uh, will either answer it directly uh, or will alert me. So I can see that there is one uh, comment in the chat. So let me just take a quick look here. Uh, why is the put only uh, line lower than the call only? Okay, excellent uh, question, right? Well, because uh, they don't have to be symmetrical, right? So, uh, you know, basically um, uh, call option and put option, they, they don't have to have exactly the same price. So the negative, you know, distance here, is the price of the call. Negative distance here is the price of the put. Why is this bigger? Because generally put options are, um, well, um, actually, let's, let's avoid generalizations, right? I wanted to say put options are more expensive, but actually not always, right? But saying they're not the same, right? So there, are, there is no reason why put and call should have exactly the same price. Because first of all, uh, uh, you know the uh, stock um, there is a risk free interest rate, right? So in other words, the stock um, uh, even if you adjust for the market price of risk, the stock price will grow, right? So second uh, is that there is something called volatility skew, which is that when traders price options, they assume certain volatility because if there is no volatility, stock price does not change, then the option price will be either zero or or, or you know um, stock current stock minus strike. So when traders price options, they assume volatility. And when they price calls, they assume different volatility from when they price puts, right? So uh, there is no price for them to be the same. I just made uh, put more expensive than the call. Sometimes it's the other way around. Uh, and uh, you know this is the reason, um, uh, basically this is the market in which the median investor thinks that the catastrophe for the stock is more likely than uh, you know, huge success. Right, so that's why they price the put option, where they have to essentially buy from someone a worthless stock, more expensive than the call option, where they have to sell, uh, uh, you know, basically help someone buy a very expensive stock at a lower price. So they don't have to be the same. Uh, in a lot of cases, put is more expensive than the call for the same strike. Sometimes it's the opposite. So, 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 but the key thing is that they don't necessarily. Equal. All right, very good question, by the way. All right, so now uh, let's continue because we have a lot of material uh, to cover today. Foreign exchange, right? Currency carry trade. So for the foreign exchange, we'll discuss actually a very complex trade, right? Just to show that it's not all about, you know, many people uh, who uh, think of mathematical finance uh, believe it's just about pricing call and put options. Actually, it's not, right? So let me give you an example of actually a very sophisticated trade. And that's, by the way, it's not just a hypothetical trade for you know teaching students, right? This is actually a real trade, bank trade, right? You have to deal with the trade. It's actually a very popular type of trade. So you know, in, in a moment you'll see why. So currency carry trade means borrowing in low or negative interest rate currency and using the borrowed money to earn interest in a high interest rate currency. So, for example, two years ago, the short-term euro interest rate was negative, and it is still negative today. If you're credit worthy, obviously you can't just come from the street and say, hey, you know, give me a hundred million euro, right? But if you're a bank or investment manager, if you're credit worthy, and if you sign a document called ISTA, uh, you could borrow 100 million euro and receive additional money from whoever lent you the money to store the hundred million euro, right? So it's negative interest. So we discussed that in lecture two, so when interest rates are negative, that's when the banks cannot really make money on the um, uh, you know deposits that they have, but they need security guards, you know they need compliance, you know it's very expensive. So they will lend money to you at the negative interest rate, which means uh, or, or rather, you know, whoever takes the money does not have to pay the interest on what they borrow. They actually get paid for storing quote unquote the money, right? And uh, that actually is. You know, it's a very strange concept. I think that if you are thinking about retail, meaning physical persons, individuals, right? You know, let's, uh, say, well, here, you know, please uh, lend me $100, right? I'm short on money. And by the way, pay me for taking this away from you. Of course, it's ridiculous, right? But when we're talking about banking, about the global finance, actually, negative interest rates actually exist. In effect, they've been around for a long time. The link to government policy when the government is trying to uh, prevent uh, essentially, you know, keep economy economy running. So they make uh, they basically government gives money, uh, lends money to banks at a very low rate, and that says the level of the interest rates that sometimes is negative, and you know that's uh, how modern finance works. 
So if your credit worthy, you could borrow 100 million euro and receive additional money to quote unquote store this, right? So negative interest. Okay, and the euro to Australian dollar AUD is, so euro is euro, right? And Australian AUD is Australian dollar. Australian euro to Australian dollar FX rate two years ago was 164. So you could take 100 million you just received and exchange it for 164 million Australian dollars. And in Australian dollars, unlike in euro, right? The interest rate was positive two years ago and is positive today. Whereas in euro, it was negative two years ago and it's still negative today, even though of course, uh, you know, inflation is coming as well now. So not for long, right? But still, you know, it's, it's basically became almost zero, but, um, but uh, the, uh, uh, you know, euro essentially is um, a currency which, uh, you know, did not skyrocket right yet, but, but uh, Australian dollar was always positive anyway. So the short term, Australian dollar interest rate was positive two years ago and still positive today. And you can lend your 164 million and receive positive interest. So by borrowing euro at a negative interest rate, converting euro to dollar, and then lending uh, you know, Australian dollar at the positive interest rate, you earn interest on both sides of the deal, right? So let's just think about, right? So we borrowed money in one currency, converted to another currency, and lend it to someone. So we receive interest when we borrow, and after changing the currency, we receive interest when we lend. So we inter receive interest both times. It's amazing, right? But it gets even better, right? At the end of the trade, we will receive, uh, you know, we will have uh, our uh, 164 million Australian dollar because we lend it to someone, they will give it back to us. And we need to convert it back. Uh, sorry, one second, there's a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, Alexander, we have already three questions. So probably we need to make a break and answer them. Okay, let's do that. Excellent. All right. So, um, Right. So, okay. So, one I already answered. Uh, does not that uh, does it not violate put call parity? Uh, no, the put call parity is that the call minus the put uh, plus the stock price is equal to strike. Uh, it does not say that the call is equal to the put. So, so again, very good question. You know about put call parity. So clearly, uh, you know you studied this, but it works in a different way. So, the put call parity is the call minus the put. Right, is the uh, um, uh, equal to stock minus the strike. Uh, straddle is the call plus the put. Right, and generally call and put are not equal, right? So, so call minus put is equal to stock minus the strike. Right, uh, okay, so let's see, more detailed. Okay, so she can see put call parity implies uh, so, uh, Yeah, exactly. Well, it looks like someone actually, okay, so, uh, so Vladimir um, from Johannesburg, I think I know who that is answered, uh, gave the same answer already in the chat, All right? So in, what is the third one? Uh, I think I answered already, uh, it was is one month down, let's see. Because the first one I already answered, right? So I think it's all of the questions for now. All right, so let's go back to the uh, presentation, right? So so the second question was actually the answer to the first, right? And the same answer I've given, right? Okay, but but the question was actually very good, yeah, because there is such thing as put call parity, it's just, uh, uh, apply, it does not apply here because it's the minus, not the plus. Right, so now uh, at the end of the trade, right, we'll have 164 million Australian dollars, but we'll need to convert it back to euro so we can return euro, 100 million euro to the original lender, right? In two years ago, uh, the euro to AUD FX rate was 164, but today is 146. So it went actually, you know, I know it's like take a second, you know, to mentally figure out, actually it went in our favor, right? So at the end of the trade, we can convert Australian dollar back to Euro, but we, with a profit, right? We get 112 million. So we can return a hundred million to the original lender and make additional 12 million Euro profit. So when we're all here, right? So we're earning profit on the street, from the street in three ways. We earn interest on both sides, plus additional 12 million Euro on FX. That's amazing. I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, it's basically no surprising the street is so popular. And actually it is in fact popular. Right, you have an interest on both sides and profit on FX. Well, in reality, uh, in negative interest rates, uh, first of all, I'm simplifying here because uh, you know maybe overnight rate is negative, right? But the long term rate is not. So, uh, and also, if you're a corporate, you pay spread, right? So, you may not earn interest on both sides, but you earn more interest on one side than on the other. So, you make profit on the interest. That's one of the you know things about the carry trade, right? And you also you know, if you get lucky and, you know, FX uh, rate works with you, right? You know, you make money on FX, but if the FX rate does not change, then you, you just earn interest, right? So this is kind of amazing trade, right? You make money in three ways here, 
when things are not so good in the markets a little worse for you, you still make money in two ways out of three, right? Not bad. So what's going on here, right? Where's the risk? Because we learned, right? We learned before that arbitrageurs make sure that there is no reward without risk. So this is the clear, the trade that just works amazingly well and all you do is earn money here all across, right? So who are these people who trade against you, right? Are they being stupid? You know, like why, why, why would someone else, you know, so why would it happen that people would be on the other side of the street? What's going on, right? All right, well, it's time for the poll, right? So clearly there is some risk here, right? So where is the risk, right? So is it credit risk? Well, and of course, all four are correct answers in the sense that all of these types of risk. So the question is, uh, where is the greatest risk to profit of the street coming from? And all three represent some risk. So the question is not whether any of this is the only risk. All four of them, I say, not all three, all four. All four of them represent some risk. The question is, what's the biggest risk? Is it credit risk? Because Australian banks are more likely to default than German banks, right? So when you lend money from the Germans for in Euro, right? And uh, lend them to the Australians in Australian dollar, is your risk that they will not give it back to you, right? Is the risk that the euro interest rate will change? Is the risk that the Australian dollar interest rate will change? Or is the risk that the FX rate may change? So let's go to the poll. All right, let's check on. Launch, all right. So open for voting. You can vote anonymously. Off to the races, let's see. Okay, so I already have uh, some number of correct answers here. Oh boy. Okay, so only correct answers uh, so far. Let's wait a little bit. Uh, well, one, uh, yeah, one, one, one wrong answer. So to, today, I think it's like a real professionals in the lecture. So, all right. Uh, okay, so uh, this is absolutely amazing, right? 45% voted, 51. Let's wait until 60. Okay, so if you're not sure, just choose randomly. Just kidding. All right. Just your gut feeling. Yeah, right. You should gut feeling. Okay, right. All right, 57%. 60%. All right, let's kind of close the poll. Wow, okay. So very impressive results, right? So basically, out of 21 people who answered, 17 got it right. FX rate may change. That's the biggest risk, right? So very good. You know, that's absolutely the correct answer, right? And um, why is that, right? So let's uh, take a look here. So the reason uh, this is the case, right, is that uh, the main source of risk uh, is that FX rate may change. And uh, this is why the, uh, you know, carry trade is considered an FX trade, even if it earns um, uh, um, uh, much of an income via interest payments. In the end of the trade, there is no guarantee that we will be able to convert the funds back to euro without losing money. Carry trade investors were lucky, right, between 2020 and 2022, and in many other time periods. Because this trade, oh, sorry, uh, exchanges a large probability of a small profit for a small probability of a large loss. Many things in financial markets do that, right? So that's why, uh, you know, so many times, you know, people basically think that they have a winning trading strategies, but they don't, right? And both retail investors uh, who go and trade, uh, you know, forex or, uh, or 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 crypto, as well as you know, professional investment managers. Actually, there is a book actually very brilliant book i recommend really anyone in finance uh, i think it's uh, this book is actually you know i mentioned it already before uh, by burton malkiel right random book down wall street this book is highly controversial in long, among investment professionals because uh, you know it basically says that there's a lot more randomness to investment manager performance than people normally would like to think but it really tells you, uh, you know, that how you can um, uh, basically uh, fool yourself and you know think you have a good strategy when all that's happening is essentially you traded the high probability of a small profit, or you know even sizable profit, right? For for a small probability of losing everything, and financial markets will do that for you, right? So the the carry trade, and actually one of the future trade, one of the trades a little bit further down the line today in today's lecture is actually will demonstrate that the carry trade is almost a pure bet on the direction of effects. But it's a very interesting type of bet, right? For you, it's enough that the effects rate does not change. Normally, when you make a bet, you say, uh, you know, I am making a bet the effects rate will go up, right? So I buy a call option. So here. It's a little bit different type of bet. 
you're making a bet that the effects rate will not go anywhere. And the effects rate is a strange animal. It's not like, you know, it's different from other assets because, um, uh, you know, stocks behave a little bit different from effects rate. The effects rate is not affected only by the capital markets. It's also affected by government's trade and so forth, right? People, you know, exchanging money. So, so FX uh, is different from other asset classes. It's affected more by the real world, perhaps, than some of the other asset classes uh, are. And FX rate, it kind of tends to move in jumps a little bit more than other assets, right? So in other words, it stays constant, right? And all of a sudden, there's a big change. And uh, the bet on the carry trade is that the FX rate does not change, right? And essentially, you just hope it doesn't jump, because if it jumps, you toast, right? And we got lucky here. Well, you know, if we invested two years ago and uh, exited, uh, you know, recently, or, you know, this month, we would have been lucky because it's like not only it just didn't move, it, 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 we would have been, we would have made money if it didn't move, but actually it moved in our favor, right? But let's look here, right? So this is the same effect rate from 18, 2018, 2022, right? And you can see that if you enter it somewhere here and you exit it somewhere here, you actually move in your favor. Basically, FX rate moving lower works in your favor here. But look at this peak, right? If you entered before this peak, right, and exited after this peak, what would happen is that somewhere in the middle of the trade, it would look like you you would uh, be risking a huge loss. And if you have to exit exactly when the FX rate is here, you would lose you know a huge chunk of the principal. But if the effect rate moves against you in this way, in the middle of the period, and it's, it still recovers later, right? So in other words, uh, you started the carry trade, effects rate moves, but in the middle of the carry trade, you actually don't care about the effects rate, right? You only care about it at the end. When you're in the middle of it, you're not trading Forex, right? You're receiving interest in one currency. You are receiving negative interest or paying small positive interest in another currency. So you are not directly sensitive as part of, you know, through the trade itself to the foreign exchange rate between the start of the carry trade and the end of the carry trade. We only care, you only are sensitive to the foreign exchange rate at the beginning and at the end, but there is margin account, right? So people who trade in this markets, right? So they trade on margin. When you borrow this hundred million from someone, right? They you have an obligation if the trade goes again. Basically, you have an obligation. In other words, you know they lend money to you, right? But uh, you know they, if you go bankrupt, they want to get it back, right? If you're risking to go bankrupt. So the margin rule state that if the value of the trade becomes significantly less than the money that you borrowed, you have to put up the extra money. And if you don't have the extra money, there's something called the margin call where you force you to liquidate the position to stop the trade early. And that crystallizes this loss. So even if you start here, you end here, and this thing is just temporary, they will not let you come to the down to the other side and make profit, right? Here, when it goes up, you say, well, put up some extra money. If you can't, the trade is stopped. The loss is what's called crystallized, right? So in other words, the loss is not final. You may still recover. But when the loss is crystallized, this is final. You exit the trade. The loss cannot be changed anymore, and it's a loss. So, People basically who do the carry trade, they bet that this peak does not happen, right? So if you're here, you're good. If you're here, you're good. If you just happen to borrow here and you hope to exit here, you lost, right? You lost large fraction of the principal. So that's the, the large loss that has small probability. And that's why in a lot of times you have small profit or you know, medium-sized profit with high probability, but not 100%. So that's the carry trade. All right, any questions about the carry trade? We will we'll go to the next asset class. No questions. No questions. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, uh, one second. So we put back um, uh, the chat so I can see it. All right, so now interest rate, right? So derivatives linked to interest rate index, such as the OS rate. And by the way, note that there are two asset classes here which are both related to interest. One is interest rate, and the other one is called fixed income. Okay, so contrary to common sense, they are not the same, right? In both cases, you have uh, instruments linked to interest, but in one case, there is a published interest rate and you receive money based on this interest rate. So that's the interest rate asset class. In another case, you buy and sell bonds. And these bonds pay you interest based on the coupon. Almost the same, still different asset class, right? So we'll consider them separate. 
So for the interest rate, we consider a cross-currency basis swap, right? So, uh, you know, we, in lecture two, studied um, fixed for floating or vanilla swap, right? And the, uh, um, uh, yeah, and the um, uh, swap that we studied then had fixed payment exchange for floating payments, right? So the one party was uh, paying fixed coupon, the other party was uh, paying floating interest rate, such as the OS rate, right? Or some, you know, overnight index. Index uh, for borrowing, in order to uh, determine how much interest you have to pay for borrowing over one day, then you compound it, right? So the, the, of course, all of us studied compounding, right? And uh, you compound it and that's the payment of your instrument. Okay, now basis swap is floating for floating, but based on different indices, right? So basis swap, unlike a vanilla swap, is when both leg pay floating interest, but based on a different index. Now cross currency swap is when parties exchange payments in different currencies. And it may be fixed for floating or floating for floating, right? So two things here. One, basis swap is when you pay floating, you receive floating, but based on different indexes. One, for example, maybe the average rate for borrowing from the government, and the other maybe the average rate from borrowing from the banks. And there are swaps that basically uh, allow you to trade one interest rate for the other, both floating. Cross currency, you change payments in different currencies. One may be floating, the other may be fixed. Sometimes both are fixed, sometimes both are floating, but they're in different currencies. And cross-currency swap also includes the exchange of principal in each currency. So when you trade, uh, when you have a cross-currency swap, if you don't exchange the principal, you're actually taking significant foreign exchange risk. And you know, we'll see in a moment why. So in order to make it a purely instrument about interest rates, what you do is that in different currencies, right, you exchange some fixed amount of money, then you pay interest on this amount, then you exchange the amounts back. So when you put the two together, right, when you have cross currency and both indices are floating, we get cross currency basis swap, right? And generally, this exchange of principle, you know, people who are used to single currency interest rate instruments, it's kind of a little ridiculous to them, right? Because you exchange interest. But actually, it's always essential, but when you have two legs of the swap, right? So leg is one side of the payment. So for example, there's a fixed leg and floating leg. So there are two legs, each party to the swap pays one of the legs and receives the other leg. So exchange of principle is always there, but it's not visible for the single currency because the amounts are the same, right? So in other words, there's no point in sending 100 million euro to someone and they send 100 million euro to you. All you did is that basically you just trained the bank transfer system by sending identical payment in both directions. And you have something called settlement risk where you may send the payment, but don't receive it back. That actually happens, right? But for different currencies, these are not the same. You're sending euros, receiving dollars uh, or Australian dollars. So exchange of principle is always part of the swap, right? Even though if you studied single currency swaps, you may not realize it. All right, so for cross currency swap, the value of principal payments is made equal in the start date. So really, it only happens in the end, again, because in the start date, you just make it identical in value, right? And at the end date, at the end, it's not. So here's how it looks, right? Uh, these are the cash flows of the current cross-currency basis swap. You receive interest. You basically, first you exchange Euro for Australian dollar. And there is no principal, green is principal, right? There's no exchange here because the values are the same. So we could make like a similar kind of shadow, uh, you know, uh, exchange here, right? But the values are the same, so, so we didn't. Then you receive, one party receives interest in the Australian dollar. The other party receives interest in Euro. Then at the last date of the swap, they receive each one final interest payment in the principal in each currency. Okay, so where have we seen this trade before, right? It looks very familiar. Okay, so this is actually the same in the currency trade we just studied, but there is a difference. I normally would do a poll about this difference, but we have a lot of material and uh, you know we need to um, keep moving forward. So we're not doing the poll. So I'll just tell you, right? So the difference is uh, for the currency carry trade, the effects rate for the final principal exchange is poor effects on the end date, which it means that you don't know what it is until you come to the end of the period. In other words, you come to the end of the carrier trade and you see what the FX rate is. And that's when you find out if you made money or lost money. 
For the cross-currency basis swap, the effects rate is set in advance, right? So it's like carry trade plus you in advance decide what the effects rate will be by buying, for example, uh, FX forward, right? Or FX future. So this is actually, again, instrument that we studied in lecture two. So the FX, uh, sorry, the cross-currency basis swap is like a fully hedged currency carry trade. What is fully hedged? That's from lecture three. Fully hedged means that you bought a financial instrument and then you added other instruments to completely eliminate all risk. Fully hedged means that you eliminated any risk from the transaction, right? So there is no variation in your outcome, right? It's predetermined. Okay, now what is the price of a fully hedged financial instrument? Zero, right? Why? Because if the fully hedged financial instrument that has predetermined outcome would have positive price, that would be arbitrage. People will just arbitrageurs will just keep buying, buying, buying this instrument until they bankrupt, uh, you know, people who are selling. Who are not obviously very smart, right? If they're selling some instrument, that just gives constant profit to someone. So these instruments don't exist. If you eliminate all risk, the price of that investment is zero in the financial markets. Arbitrageurs make sure that of that. Now, how, how can we can this be, right? You know, this is a complex instrument. There are all kinds of payments going back and forth. Why would the value be always zero, right? This actually, you know, this is similar to this question about put call parity, right? So it's, it's also a different type of parity, right? It's not a put call parity, but this is, um, uh, you know, this is like interest parity. Okay, so let's see if we can um, uh, see it. So first of all, right, by definition of the floating index, today's value of the compounded index payments, right? So when you basically get the overnight rate and you keep compounding, so you take the interest from overnight, you reinvest it the next day, you reinvest the interest for two days again. So by definition of the floating index, today's value of compounded future index is the same as the money you would receive by lending the principal. Why? Because lending the principal, other than for credit risk, which for the moment we will ignore, right? Lending the principal for a year is the same as lending it for one day, then for the next day, then for the next day, right? If you lend the principal for one day, you receive the floating interest. If you reinvest it and keep doing it, you will get some amount of money. If you just lend the principal and say, well, you know what? I'm just going to lend it to you for the year, right? I'm not going to like lend it to you for a day, then give it back to you the next day. You give it back to me and then give it back to you the next day. So these two, two things are the same, right? So floating interest that you just receive day after day and, and compound reinvest is the same as the amount of money you would receive. You just give someone the money and say, pay me normal like prevailing interest rate. So each leg of the basis swap, right? So the basis swap, you know, has two legs, right? One party pays dollar, the other one is euro. Uh, this is one leg, right? It has the payments, it has the principal. So this principal in the beginning was not drawn on the previous chart because it's equal to the other side. But now let's pretend that they actually exchanged, right? So principal here, interest payments, principal here. The price of cross-currency basis swap or of the fully hedged carry trade is zero, not because the legs balance each other, but because each leg is zero, right? So it's the sum of two things with the zero price and your initial inclination say, oh, it means that one thing is equal to minus the other thing. Well, that's true, right? But even better, right? Each of them is zero. So the sum is zero because you, you zero plus zero is zero. Why is one zero? Well, because this interest is the same as the amount of money you would otherwise receive by lending the principal. So when you lend the principal to someone, you are essentially giving us some interest, but then they pay you this interest. So the total value of this whole leg is zero because that interest is the same one that you would receive if you didn't do the trade, right? If you just kept the money and invested in it, put in the back, it would be exactly the same outcome as doing this leg. So the leg price is zero, right? Again, because if it wasn't, it would be riskless profit. You would do the leg, put the money in the bank or borrow the money from the bank and do the leg, right? So if the prices were not the same, a bit of yours would bankrupt whoever was you know, selling this instrument. So the price of the cross-currency basis swap is zero. That's a fully hedged carry trade, carry trade plus the future or forward for the uh, foreign exchange rate. And now we understand why the carry trade is an FX asset class, because 
it has no risk if you combine it with the FX instrument, right? So what it means is that if the sum of the FX instrument and the carry trade is zero, it has no risk. That means that the risk of the carry trade is the reverse of the risk of the FX instrument. Now the question is why, why would people trade, you know, the scare, do the scare trade if it's just the same as the FX instrument? Well, because FX instruments actually carry trades you do for you know pretty long time, right? FX actually doesn't trade that way. Uh, and uh, you know there are all kinds of you know it's, I can probably discuss like you know for an hour about the carry trade and you know why people do it as opposed to just FX. But the key reason is that FX markets normally are very short dated, right? So they're, they're not you know people don't trade normally long dated FX. So carry trade is a way to make a very long dated or long term FX investment that you know doesn't go days and months, but goes actually years and you know multiple years, right? So these two things connected to each other from these two sections and let's move on um, to the next one, right? So I kind of already went through the slides. So, uh, so uh, actually, you know, I'm sorry. Um, uh, one more question. Yeah, let me just ask another question. Actually, no, sorry, I didn't go through the slide. So this is one additional point that I'll cover. Right, one more question. All right, so let's see here. Uh, um, uh, but isn't reinvesting interest every day less risky than lending out for a year? Yes, given default, absolutely. Casper, thank you. So I can see that. Uh, I can see that uh, that uh, uh, you know you've uh, uh, know this topic very well. Yes, remember in the beginning I said uh, if we ignore credit risk, right? So you're absolutely right. So reinvesting every—that's the reason, by the way, why LIBOR, which is the rate of uh, investment over one month, was abolished in favor of OS rate, which is over one day, because in LIBOR, which is investment over actually not one month, like three months or six months typically, so LIBOR rate had too much of the credit risk. And when LIBOR rate went up, it was sometimes because the interest rates were up and sometimes because the banks were not considered credit worthy. So overnight rate was, became the dominant rate and LIBOR was abolished specifically because overnight lending has very little credit risk because basically if you know the bank, uh, like you read the newspaper, you know, if the bank is going to go bankrupt, right? You know about it in advance, right? There is a risk to that, you know, basically it just doesn't happen like all of a sudden, it, 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 very rarely it does, right? So when you lock up the money and you give money to someone for a year or for three months or for six months, right? And then you see the newspaper, so well, the bank is in trouble, run on the bank, you know, okay, well, bankrupt, right? That's it. And it's still, you know, basically you give them the money for three months and one month later it happens and your money is lost. For overnight, you always have uh, so you have uh, the ability to not give it the next day. So you're absolutely right. Giving the money to someone overnight, giving it back, getting it back, then next day getting it back, of course, is safer in terms of default risk. It's only the same thing when you ignore credit risk. So in the beginning, when I said, if we ignore credit risk, that's exactly what I meant, right? So if we don't consider default, then it's the same. Otherwise, it's not the same. And I was talking about interest rate uh, specifically um, component here. If you look at the credit component, they're different. All right. So uh, excellent question. And uh, you know, basically, the key to the to the answer to this question is basically not uh, considering credit risk uh, uh, in this particular argument. All right. Now, one thing, last thing about the basis swap before we move on, and we really should because you know we still have a lot to cover. Is that a basis swap would not have been very useful if the price was exactly zero, right? So, in other words, uh, you know, it was helpful to understand the risk of the carry trade. Now, the question: Why do people trade basis swap? Well, the thing is, um, uh, it's not exactly zero, right? So, it should be zero if uh, everything is frictionless, right? If there is no tax differences, if there is no legal differences, if there is no cross-border liquidity differences, right? Where basically some instruments are just harder to find investors that sell them, right? So the cross-currency basis swap or any basis swap usually is the price is almost zero, but not exactly. And people just want to eliminate this risk, right? So there are investors who don't want this risk of, uh, you know, whatever, like, you know, you basically did the cross-currency trade and then in the other currency, they impose some tax or whatever. There is slight risk. That's why this, you know, the, the profit, which is basically paid as a spread, right? You, you have one floating index, the other floating index. It should be zero, but it's not exactly. So one party has to pay the other a little bit more interest to compensate. So that's an example of buying and selling the risk that you don't want in a financial markets. People who don't want even this little residual risk, they can invest or use basis swap as part of their trade, or as part of the investment strategy, 
so they're just not exposed to this risk at all. They pay someone to take it off the hands, and that's the purpose of basis swap. All right, fixed income. Interest rates also, but that you know, basically through bonds, right? You buy an asset, it pays you interest, as opposed to a contract in which you look up an index and pay the amount of money based on that, right? So slight difference, but different types of class. So how long can a bond maturity be? Right. So bonds, you know, we all know what bonds are, right? So you know, you basically buy a bond from someone, they pay you interest. Eventually, they have to pay back the principal. Well, some of the most popular bonds in the world, like the U.S. Treasury bonds, have maturities up to thirty years, and U.S. Treasury is or was considering issuing hundred-year bonds, right? So these maturities are nothing compared to the Canadian Pacific Corporation bond, which has one thousand-year maturity, right? One thousand years. But wait, that's not the limit, right? So there are bonds that don't have a maturity day and pay interest forever. The oldest active perpetual bond was issued in 1648 by a private Dutch water association. It is printed on Godskin and is currently in the Yale Light University Museum in the United States. And it continues to pay interest to the Yale Investment Fund, right? So many, many years ago, uh, Yale University, soon after it was founded, uh, bought this bond from the Dutch, from the Dutch Water Association of some city, right? They, they basically they used to to, to finance, uh, you know, protecting the land from 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 the sea, because you know Netherlands Netherlands is mostly below sea level, right? So so they did a good thing. The farmers in Netherlands uh, did not get flooded, uh, and they're still paying interest, right? And they will be paying it forever, right? So this is how it works, right? So when the perpetual bond is issued, the buyer pays the issue the bond principal. After that, the bond interest payments continue in perpetuity. So theoretically, the bond buyer has to return the principal, but the sale will run out of fuel before this happens. So we're not going to consider this cash flow, right? So basically, you receive the principal. If, if, if basically, if, if you are investing in this bond, you pay the principal, and then you receive the interest three months, six months, you know, thousand years. Then the sun runs out of fuel, and uh, actually, well, you know, it will become a supernova. Uh, consume Earth, whatever, as you know, it will become a red giant, consume Earth, then it'll become a supernova, or maybe it wouldn't, I don't remember, for sun. Anybody remembers uh, sun will become a supernova or not, but I know if it, if it will become a red giant and consume Earth. And only then the interest payments will stop, okay? Or if the water association will default. So how can someone sell basically you, you know, an obligation to pay interest forever? Wouldn't they go bankrupt? Would it be crazy like, you know, forever, right? Well, actually, no, because what happens is if you bought a perpetual bond with $100 principal and 2% coupon, when prevailing interest rates are flat 2%, right? So suppose that today's interest rate was 2% and the obligation to pay interest a year from now was also 2% and 100 years from now is 2%. Well, that's called a flat yield curve. In this case, it completely makes sense to pay 100 for this bond, right? Because basically it's the same, right? So you have $100 and you will receive 2% of interest. Or you can buy this bond for 100 and they will pay you 2% of interest. Likewise, if you are selling this bond, you say, well, I can borrow money from the bank at 2% or I can sell someone the, the bond and I will pay them 2%. So it's not crazy because uh, you know money basically loses value. Uh, and if you lend someone money, you earn interest. And Doing it perpetually is the same thing as, you know, if you have $100 and you put it in the bank, you will also receive interest perpetually. So when you compare the two things, they're actually equal. So they're all crazy. You know, it's uh, basically perfectly makes sense to have a perpetual bond. In fact, some of the longer dated, like 30 or 50 year bond, really the most value of this bond is the interest, maybe like 10% is the principal. When interest rates are high for a 30 year bond, only about 10% or you know 20% of the value is the principal. So it really doesn't really matter that much if the principal is returned to you. It's the interest that makes uh, it valuable, mostly. So that's okay, right? Now, the question, how do you price it, right? And that's a poll, right? So if you bought a perpetual bond with 2% interest when the short rate was also 2%, and then the short rate increased to 2.1% after that, right? So you bought the bond when the interest rate for, you know, in the bank, paid by the bank was 2%. And then after you bought it, the, in, the, short, the interest paid by the bank increased. What happened to the bond price? Did it increase by 5%, which is the difference between 2.1 and 2, right? Decreased by 5% or did not change because it has nothing to do with deposits. So let's go to the poll. All right, one second. 
All right. So please make your decision quickly because a lot of material and I'm trying to make sure we finish on time. All right, so we have two leading contenders, five out of 10 answers each, six out of 12 answers each, still uh, running head to head. Of course, only one of them is correct. Okay, so now we have one answer also, one, one last answer. Sorry, what, what third answer finally get, uh, get um, uh, got um, uh, vote. Oh, more votes uh, for the third. Okay, so now all three get some votes. There's a leader. And the leader is wrong, actually, answer. So the leading answer is wrong at this time. All right, 54% people voted. Just wait a minute. The good, the, the correct answer can still win. Uh, maybe not. All right, well, uh, let's end the poll because we need, oh, 60%, okay, fine, yeah. All right, well, uh, regretfully, the wrong answer just keep pulling up um, uh, results, right? So the poll results that did not change as the winner and decreased by five or increased by five is about uh, the same. Okay, so, well, you know, let's see what the real answer is. Um, okay, so again, the short rate increased to 1%, right? So actually the price is decreased by 5%, right? Because what happens is that the interest rates that perpetual bond pays on this principle, the principle is always, let's say, hundred dollars, right? So the principle of the bond is written. You, you have this goat. You know, you saw this picture of the goat skin text on the printed on the goat skin because paper is not durable enough, right? So it's printed on the goat skin, and it's on the Yale University Library. And somewhere there, it says how many golden Dutch currency is the principal, right? So principal does not change. And the interest rate the bond pays on the principal also does not change. It's, a, it's probably for this bond, it's not 2%, but it's some percentage, right? But the interest rate it pays on the price has to compete with what investors can get by investing the same amount in a short-term bank deposit. So uh, in, in, let's ignore the market price of risk, right? So the, so the price V of the perpetual bond with principal N and coupon C solves this equation, right? So the price times the interest rate in the bank is equal to principal times the coupon. Because if you can make more make money by borrowing money from the bank, investing it in the bond and receiving bond interest instead of the bank interest, if one was bigger, it was larger than the other, arbitrageurs would just keep doing it until they bankrupt the sellers of the bond or they don't have any bonds to sell. So if the interest rates go higher, let's say the interest go to 4%, right? In this case, you would be foolish to receive 2%. If you basically have $100, right? You put it in the bank, suppose that the interest rate was 2% and you bought the bond uh, in, you know, basically the bond coupon was set to 2% as well. And then the interest rates were, became, inflation happened and interest rates became 4%. In this case, you will be foolish instead of putting your $100 in the bank and receiving a 4% interest, giving this $100 to the seller of the bond and receiving 2% interest. So you'll tell them, hey, you know what? You have to lower the bond price. Otherwise, I would not buy it from you. How much do they have to lower it? They have to lower it exactly half, right? Because if you have $100, you can receive 4% interest in the bank. Or if the bond price is 50, half of what it used to be, if the bond price is 50, you buy two bonds. Each bond will pay you 2% on the principal, right? In total four. So the bond, perpetual bond price is inversely proportional to the interest rate that you get in the bank. Not to the coupon, but, but to the interest rate in the bank. So this is proportional, is directly proportional to the interest rate of the bond itself, of course, right? Because the more the, you know, twice more interest, twice more the price, right? But it's inversely proportional to the uh, rate offered by the bank. Because if the rate offered by the bank is twice higher, you will go to them and say, hey, you know, basically I, I want to price, uh, I want to buy your bond for half the price, because then it will be equal to, to putting money in the bank. So perpetual bond price is inversely proportional to the prevailing interest rate elsewhere. Generally, the higher interest rates elsewhere, the lower the bond prices are because this elsewhere, like bank deposits or some new, newly issued bonds, provide a more attractive alternative. So the more attractive the alternative is to investing somewhere else, the lower the bond price. 
the bond price will keep falling until you can buy so many of these bonds that all of these bonds will collectively pay more coupon than the alternative. So any bond will fall in price with the interest rate provided available elsewhere will fall. But for the perpetual bond is exactly the inverse proportional relation. Right. Any questions about this? Not if yet. not, if not, we move to credit, right? So credit derivatives are the result of a revolutionary idea that insurance against someone's bankruptcy can be sold as a financial instrument. There was actually, uh, you know, a retreat, right? So in the bank, uh, you know, that's one example why team building and retreats are actually a very good thing. So some bankers went, uh, you know, to a retreat and they brainstormed, well, you know, how can we take interest rate swap and uh, expand it, you know, make something new out of it. So, you know, idea came to basically sell insurance as a swap. So uh, ordinary business activities, right, as well as OTC derivative contracts, carry the risk of losses if one of the parties defaults on the contractual obligation. So this risk is called the default risk, right? So you contract with someone and they go bankrupt or just refuse to uh, fulfill the obligation, right? So instead of the normal term bankruptcy, we used before, we can use the you know more precise term default, right? They may not be bankrupt, but they may default on the obligation to you. For example, not pay you a coupon, right? A financial market participant may experience a loss as a result of a default of a party with which it entered into the over-the-counter contract. This party is called the counterparty in the risk that for example, you know, basically your counterparty will not pay you what they're supposed to. It's called counterparty credit risk or just counterparty risk. It's different from the issue risk. Issue risk is when you bought bond from someone and they decided not to pay coupon, right? It's similar, but a little bit different. So counterparty credit risk is on the over-the-counter contract. Issue risk is on the bond, but there are many similarities as well. So the revolutionary financial instruments that make it possible to buy the absence of counterparty risk. Remember, you know, in financial markets, absence of risk is the desirable commodity and you can buy it. So it has positive price, risk has negative price because absence of risk is positive price. So the absence of counterparty credit risk can be purchased through credit derivatives. And the primary or most, uh, you know, uh, popular instrument for doing that is the credit default swap. Right, so the amount of loss that will occur if the counterparty to over-the-counter contract defaults is called loss-given default, right? So it's, you know, loss-given default, LGD, right? So if they default, how much money you lose? So it's calculated as the cost to replace the OTC contract and continue with another counterparty times one minus R, where R is the recovery rate. So let me give you an example. Suppose that you uh, have a contract that uh, somebody was supposed to pay you 100 million and they defaulted. Now, the recovery rate is the percentage of loss that can on average be recovered from back counterparties. You actually don't know what it is. And this is something that financial markets kind of, uh, you know, put some very crude estimate on. And unfortunately, in the format of the short lecture, I cannot explain uh, in detail while, uh, why such a crude, you know, just say 40%, it used to be actually 20%, right? Now it's 40%. Why this estimate is not actually, uh, it's more of a market convention. Uh, in other words, uh, when you change this estimate, when everybody in the industry agrees to change this estimate from 40 to 20, from 20 to 40 or to something else, it's actually uh, not just you know mis not just repricing all of this debt, right? It just um, uh, essentially it's, it's more of a convention where if you change this assumption, then you just simply quote different rates for the same risk and the same price. But for now, let's just assume it's precise, right? It's Forty percent. In this case, if they were supposed to pay you hundred million and did not, then they would. Uh, you know, you would uh, buy 60 million worth of the instrument. You know, you would have to basically go and find someone else to pay you 60 million or to make some payments in the future that you wanted that are worth 60 million because you hope to recover 40 from the counterparty, right? So when they go bankrupt, they're not worthless, right? So if it's a bank, it has assets, you know, it has other derivatives. So the industry assumes that if somebody wanted, you know, was obliged to pay you or have had obligations to you of 100 million and defaulted or went bankrupt, that you still through the courts get 40. So you need to replace 60, right? Okay, so 
the current price, right? Uh, and interestingly enough, right, even though it is an aside, right, it's not um, what we will focus on today. But by the way, if they default when you owe money to them, you're not free to go, right? You just will owe money to the creditors. In fact, that's one of the reasons why this recovery is actually not zero, right? Because uh, all of the people who you owe money to them, uh, you know, the bankruptcy court will collect this money and give them to you. So in this case, uh, you know, so in other words, you lose money only if they default when they owe money to you. If they default when they, you owe money to them, nothing changes for you. You just pay it to someone else, right? To the creditors. So credit default swap is a derivative that makes it possible to buy the absence of counterparty credit risk. Now, the one question again, so we don't have time for the poll because of the short format of this course, how much of the CDS do we need to buy? Well, we need to buy for 60 million because 40 we get from the creditors, right? Sort of from the bankruptcy court. So for 60 million, we need the credit default swap, right? And credit default swap uh, involves two counterparties of the CDS itself, right? The third party is called the, you know, the basically two counterparties of the CDS itself. In the third party is called the reference name, like whose, whose default the CDS uh, is uh, protecting. So when you say that uh, we want CDS on 100 million, we only need the CDS and that's how the instrument works. When, when you um, uh, basically need to cover 100 million, you only want to receive 60 because 40 you would get from the other party. And to hedge, or to protect against counterparty credit risk for counterparty A, we can enter into CDS contract with counterparty B, for which A is the reference name, right? So in other words, you are afraid that bank A will go bankrupt. So you go to another bank and say, I want to a financial instrument in which you will compensate me if the first bank you know, is, um, uh, is, is defaults. So this is like an insurance. So it's an insurance sold as a financial instrument, right? And the if you maintain, if you buy and sell the CDS such that you are, um, uh, it covers always the loss given default for counterparty, then you completely protect it against all of the risk. And the way this works, right, is uh, for CDS, is the uh, first leg of CDS is called the protection leg. It pays the principal if the reference name defaults, on the next coupon date after the default, right? So, so if the reference name, and after that it disappears, right? If the reference name does not default, protection leg expires without making any payments. So if this is the default event, then party B, bank B, if this is when bank A defaulted, right? And bank A only participates, bank A here does not make any payments, does not receive any payments, we just observe it, right? So bank A is doing the business, and we're like sitting here, okay, so I, you know, are you good or not, right? So all we need to do about bank A is that if bank A made the payments that they're supposed to make to someone else, right? So we don't trade with this bank. The other bank may not trade with this bank. We just sit in the lobby and like, look, uh, you know, are people uh, really running around and, you know, basically all seem upset, right? So maybe they defaulted, right? If they didn't, then we're good, right? So this is the date at which Bank A defaulted. You know, there are no payments here from Bank A. We just observe their default. And suppose that we observe the default, right? So everybody gets upset, uh, people get fired, you know, leave uh, with the belongings in the cardboard box. That's what actually was happening when Lehman defaulted, you know, the, the all of the news media was showing people you know, leaving with cardboard boxes of belongings, right? And the bank uh, closes its doors, right? So in this case, bank B is supposed to pay you this principal, for example, um, uh, you know, 100 million, right? Okay, now you, the protection, so that's a protection leg and B bank B is protection seller. You have the fee leg, right? So you're protection buyer. So you pay them fee periodically, sort of like a fixed leg of a regular swap. And in case of a reference name default, you stop, right? So, so if the default happens, then they pay you the protection, you pay one last fee, and then the rest of the fee uh, does not happen because the default happens here. So as a protection, so this is almost like a car insurance, right? So, you know, basically if the car gets stolen, you get payment from the insurance company and you pay them uh, monthly or, you know, annually for the insurance, right? If the car gets stolen, they pay you the value of the car or replace the car. And you know you also stop paying them for the insurance right after that. And basically that's the end. Maybe you insure with them the next car. 
exactly the same thing, but traded in the financial markets. All right, so uh, so that was the credit default swap, right? As an example of a credit instrument, and there are a lot more sophisticated instruments, right? So uh, now, finally, uh, last asset class before the final hybrid asset class, and I think that we're doing well on time. So commodity, right? So beginner quants, or quants, you know, people who engage in uh, mathematical finance, right? Who choose mathematical finance as a career, they're called quants. The other thing that commodity, you know, I, I, I often saw that people who studied it uh, in mathematical finance courses or in universities. So, so there's a very prevailing view, right? When you look at the equations only, you say, oh, these equations look similar to the equations for equity. So a lot of people who didn't actually trade think that commodity derivatives are the same as equity derivatives because they're governed by the same equations, same models. With a different underlying. So you have a stochastic process for the stock price, stochastic process for the commodity price, you think they're the same. Well, these people never had to rent out a tanker to store the stock certificates, right? So there is a big difference in commodity. And the difference is that commodity is something that's actually physical as opposed to the stock certificate, which is these days electronic. So now commodities are traded primarily as futures. And the future contract is an exchange traded obligation of one party, future buyer, to buy, and the other party to sell a unit of underlying at the predetermined price called the future price. So the futures are in many ways similar to forwards, except the exchange traded securities, while forwards are OTC derivative contracts between two specific parties. And the reason commodities are traded primarily as futures is that the commodity itself is massive and expensive to deal with. Right? So a banker in New York can easily deal with stocks, bonds, interest rate deposit. All of them are electronic records these days, right? They used to be on paper and now they're electronic. The same banker does not have the ability or the skills to accept the delivery of oil that arrives by tanker to a Texas port, unload the oil and then resell it to a refinery, right? So if you're in the financial markets, you normally don't want to um, uh, you know, receive uh, oil or pork bellies, uh, meaning uh, you know livestock, pigs, uh, you know rice, uh, anything else, right? You don't want to actually want to deal with the physical commodity in uh, tankers uh, or in rail cars. So by buying and selling electronic records of future obligations, right, to buy and sell a commodity, instead of trading the commodity itself, financial market participants are able to achieve the same economic effect without dealing with the commodity itself, right? And uh, of course. There are people still who would actually deal with the commodity because if there are no people who actually would, you know, if none of the market participants would ever want to touch the actual oil or the actual rice, then the price of the future would completely disconnect from reality and it would have nothing to do with the actual price of rice. So, again, you know, thank you, the arbitrageurs, right? So, the arbitrageurs. For commodities, they're different, right? You know, they're not people uh, who are picking up nickels in front of the steamroller. They do also, in a sense, that it's risky, right? Uh, what they do, but it's not. They don't just trade in front of the computers. They actually, you know, arbitrageurs in commodity markets are the people who are willing, if the futures price on the day of delivery is out of line with the price of the actual commodity. You know, as you see that the future, let's say, assumes the price of rice is X. But if you go and see what it was to buy rice, it's actually a different uh, number. Then they will actually buy from you the electronic obligation. Then they will actually acquire the rice. They will deliver it to the other party. So arbitrageurs are the people who are willing to deal with the real commodity. They have tankers. They have rail cars. You know, they know how to do logistics. And they are the ones who keep the electronic side of the market in line with what happens in the real world. And that's the service that they provide. So now uh, the future contract, right? The future price is the price. The future price is not the price that you buy to, it's not like the option, right? So option price is the price you pay to acquire the option. Future price is not the price you pay to acquire the future. Future price is the price you agree in the, fu in the future, quote unquote, right? So, so to buy the underlying. So future future price, for example, for stock future, is the price you agree in advance to pay for the stock in the future, one year from now. Option, option price is the price you buy, you, you pay to buy the option. Future price is the price you promise to pay to buy the underlying 
some years or months from now. So now the question is, can the future price be negative, right? Can the stock price be negative? Stock price cannot be negative, right? Because stock, you know, you, you have a stock, right? It pays you dividends, it pays you interest, you may appreciate, right? So why would price be negative? Maybe it's very low. It cannot be negative, right? You know, no, nobody's saying, well, here, you know, please take the stock price. Please take the, you know, stock is the something that does not have any obligations, right? And, uh, you know, basically say, well, you know, here, please take the stock from me and I pay you money to take it, right? Well, you know, yes, thank you. You know, because you know, as an owner of the stock, I have no obligation. You know, the stock is something that will never force me to pay anything to anybody, right? So a company may default, but I still, you know, I'm not on the hook as the owner. So nobody would ever sell the stock for a negative price because whoever owns the stock has no obligation. There's no way they can lose money or be forced to pay any money. So the stock price may be zero because it's totally worthless, right? Or, or positive, right? It cannot be negative. Now the question is, can a future price be negative for stocks or interest or bond? So that's a poll, right? So there are five answers, kind of complicated, right? So future price can never be negative for anything, or it can be for equity in all futures, but not for interest rate or bond futures, right? Well, why? Because these this are more like assets, right? It can for interest rate in oil futures, but not for equity or bond. Different way to slice, right? It can for all futures, for any futures except oil and uh, or just for the oil. So let's do the poll. Again, for which of these can the future price, namely the price you agree today for the transaction, let's say a year from now, be negative? Uh, let me just, um, one second. Launch, All right? And let's uh, do it quickly because uh, we need to finish soon. Only for all futures, okay? Uh, never, not for any class. All right. That's really complex poll though, so. The question basically, you need to decide like what these things have in common, right? Are equity in all futures, those that have something in common, or are interest rate and oil futures have something in common? Or is oil special and not like anything else? So what is the, you know, there are four things here, right? Two of them, either oil is special, right? Or two of them have something in common and they're different from the other two, which ones? 50% and every answer is represented. Fifty-two. Okay, right. So let's stop at uh, fifty-two. Uh, I'm going to close the poll. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, I like it. You know, like the, the the correct answer is winning. So it's, it's great. So I'm almost tempted to wait a little bit longer, but we have to stop, right? So end the poll. Share results, right? Okay. So you see the results, right? It can for the interest rates and in all futures, but not for the other two. Correct, right? So brilliant, right? So great. Very happy, you know, correct answer. You, you gave the correct answer. Uh, and uh, by the way, you know, as I mentioned um, in the summary last slide, you know, I'll talk about the, the course completion certificate. There will be a quiz, right? So whoever answered this correctly, I think will ace the quiz and receive the certificate. So it's great. All right, so uh, the answer was correct. And uh, it's three, right? It can for the interest rate on oil or commodity futures, but not for equity or bond, right? So as scientists, we know that this means that these two have something in common that the other two don't, right? So what is it? Well, equity and bonds are electronic records which can be stored indefinitely at no cost, right? So, so stocks and bond certificates, right? And both are produced income, right? So stocks may pay dividend, they may grow. Bonds will pay interest, right? And principal repayment, right? So if future price for this will go negative, then arbitrators will jump in and buy futures for this bond because they buy the futures for the negative price. That creates an obligation for someone to basically give them the stock or bond certificate plus some extra money. Well, thank you. You know, it's wonderful because basically I have an asset that can never ever require me to pay anything to anybody, but it may pay me something, right? Maybe it's a lot, maybe it's a little, right? But I'm getting something for nothing, right? And that's in financial markets is impossible. Arbitrageurs will jump in and bankrupt people who are selling. Right, so they will not be selling for long. So this is why uh, futures, um, you know, prices for equity and bonds cannot go negative. Right, but 
the underlying to interest rate future, right? Again, so bond is a future obligation to buy a bond that's an asset, right? But interest rate future is different. You cannot buy hold and say, well, you know, it's not paying me much, I hold it, right? So interest rate future is an obligation to and to basically, uh, you know, pay interest or receive interest for a particular period of time. It's not something that you can just say here, you know, you know, it's an obligation to pay interest over, let's say, if it's overnight, like over one day, one year from now, over one month, one year from now. You cannot just say, I'm going to store it and uh, pay this interest to you based on interest rates for some other period. So in other words, interest rate futures have underlying interest rate, which cannot be quote unquote stored, right? So it's not something that you can own and receive some income from it when it pays it. It's something that requires you to do something at a particular point of time, you cannot store it, right? So you cannot store the interest rate obligation for a specific time period. So if this time period is such time period that interest rates are negative during this time period, you're actually be forced to uh, you know, pay money out. So interest rate futures actually could be negative, right? But, uh, but the stock and bond cannot. And now this brings us back to the commodity, which was the topic of this whole thing, right? So let's consider oil futures, right? So like stock and bond certificates, oil can, in principle, in principle, be stored, right? But stock and bond certificates are stored electronically. So it's free, right? It's free to store them. Uh, they're on a computer, it costs nothing, right? You buy a hard drive. Well, you know, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, it's all in the cloud and so forth, right? It doesn't cost anything, right? And they may pay something to you and never require you to pay anything. But oil has to be stored. It's a, you know, it's a difficult commodity, right? It has to be stored uh, in uh, reservoirs or in offshore tankers. And, and uh, people actually do buy tankers and sell them down to sea. In this reservoirs, tankers have insufficient capacity to store all of the oil traded in commodity futures exchanges, limiting the ability to hold oil indefinitely. So it's a non-storable commodity, right? It's like a hot potato, right? So it's a very hot potato. So you have to, I have this potato, I can't just hold on to this potato and, and wait, right? I have to, uh, you know, it's very hot, right? So you have to give it to someone. And if it's super hot and it's about to burn me, I will have to pay money to someone to take it off my hands. Because, well, you know what? You know, uh, basically, arbitrageurs, uh, you know, can buy all tankers. They can fill it with oil and prices are low, send them out to sea, right? So people even do that, right? So the price of uh, oil is negative or futures is negative, right? So, so people actually say, well, okay, I'm going to make an obligation uh, to buy this because uh, I will receive money from someone to take the oil and I will hire a tanker. I put oil in a tanker, I send a tanker to sea for three years and the crew will totally, uh, you know, go nuts there because, you know, basically they're out of sea for three years. That actually does happen, believe it or not, right? So, this, so there are some tankers actually when the price of oil was negative, you know, a few years ago when the COVID started, price of oil temporarily went negative because more oil was produced that could be stored or consumed. And you cannot just, you know, basically it's illegal to just dump it in the sea, right? So people had to pay money to take oil away from them. Of course, now with the price of gas uh, being totally crazy, you know, you know that <laughs> it seems very, uh, you know, like, was it really possible that the price of oil was negative? Yes, it was, because more was produced and could be consumed or stored. So it's like a hot potato. So you have to pay someone. So the answer is that for two different reasons. So interest rate is simply cannot be stored because it is assigned to a specific time period. And oil theoretically can be stored, but it's expensive. It's called the cost of carry. In practice, sometimes it's just uh, too much of it, right? And then the price goes negative. And finally, hybrid, right? And we need to really wrap up soon, you know. Uh, so what are hybrids, right? Uh, financial instruments that involve underlying from more than one asset class are called hybrids. So for example, there are hybrid swaps, and among them, there are FX link swaps and equity link swaps. Uh, they're like, uh, you know, honey or condensed milk, well, you know, both, right? But don't bother about the bread. Hybrid instruments have uh, high profits, but also a very high level of risk. And they require sophisticated risk management to be traded safely. And for example, an equity link cross currency swap is similar to a conventional cross currency swap. but it pays interest not on a fixed amount of money, but on a fixed number of shares of stock. So the principle of that swap goes up and down depending on the stock price. Otherwise, it's just a normal swap. So this combines interest rate asset class because it's a swap. And it also involves equity because it's linked to the price of a stock. So that's a hybrid instrument. And finally, 
conclusion. We hope you enjoyed the course. That's most important. Tomorrow on Friday, we will send email uh, by email uh, to everyone who registered a download link for the slides full for lectures of the course. So you can review them. Then on Monday, we'll email a link to an online quiz. It will be graded on a pass fail uh, you know, system. So in other words, no A, B, C, whatever, you know, grades, right? Pass or fail. Those who will pass and things, you know, basically those of you who answered this poll questions correctly should ace the quiz. Uh, those who will pass will receive an electronic uh, certificate of course completion with QR code, so you know can put in your resume. Uh, and also on Monday uh, is the first lecture of a new course uh, called Enterprise Software Development on Python. So it's intended for those, and perhaps as you, who already know Python scripts and Jupyter notebooks, but would like to learn how to build large-scale enterprise software packages in Python as part of a professional software development organization. In mathematical finance right now, Python has become the prevailing programming language. So people program in Python. And I will focus somewhat on this course about doing mathematics in Python, right? And uh, there will be some examples, um, uh, you know, of how to run uh, math code in Python, you know, how to do it properly and so forth. But this course is not about the math and it's not about the finance. This course is to, you know, is about what difference is between writing a, one of script, writing a Jupyter notebook, perhaps for coursework, or you know, if you're doing some research, and buying a you know, and building a professional, large-scale, enterprise-quality software package working as part of the team. So we'll cover how to organize submodules, how to track issues, features, how to uh, build classes, uh, you know, how to design microservices. There will be some software architecture. It will be a full lecture course, Mondays and Wednesday, this next week, next week, uh, starting Monday and next week and the following week, at the same time as this course. And finally, uh, and sorry, and the link to register is, uh, has been posted in the chat, or will be posted in a moment. And finally, if you believe that more on medical finance, uh, you know, is attractive career choice, if you enjoy the course, uh, compatible is recruiting, and we're recording at all levels, right? So, you know, people who have professional experience in, you know, software engineering, business analysis, or anything else, uh, we're happy to teach you more about mathematical finance. Please come to work for us. Uh, also, uh, guidance uh, or students at all levels. So, you know, basically, we have an interview, we have a math test, uh, we have a, you know, Python test. Uh, any grade, uh, you know, please come to talk to us. Uh, and uh, uh, we're hiring uh, all around the world. Uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, United States, Asia. Uh, we have offices also all around the world. And by the way, those who are wondering why I have a green background is because I'm currently in the Lisbon office. So the first three lectures were in the United States. Uh, this wall is the conference room in Lisbon. Uh, so if you'd like to work by the sea, please come to work for us. Uh, so please write to jobs at compatible.com. And with that, I'll turn over to Nastya, who will uh, provide some final comments. Let's say, do, do, do I, are you unmuted or? Um... Yes, I'm unmuted. So thank you all for your attendance and attention during these four courses. As Alexander has already mentioned, we are looking forward to your questions either to training at compatible.com email or if you have decided that compatible is something of your choice and dream so please email us to jobs at compatible.com also you have contacts of regional hr managers who are in contact with you so please feel free to contact us and we are happy to chat and regarding the python course i have posted the link to registration in our chat um, so hopefully we'll see you on monday okay great and a couple of uh, final questions there first of all does compatible provide interns with part-time opportunities uh, we do have part-time opportunities um uh, you know we would like to work with people long term so uh if you would like to come to us uh, we'd like to hope that you will want to stay. So we normally, you know, basically we don't we don't do traditional internships in the sense that someone comes in, um, uh, you know, for two months in the summer and then disappears and goes to work somewhere else. Simply because, with the type of work that we're doing, especially mathematical finance, but also other types of projects that we have like machine learning, uh, you know, and others, 
model validation. Uh, it takes very long time for someone to become productive. So, so in our line of uh, work um, uh, or you know our business, internships don't really work because you know it takes basically six months to become productive. So it doesn't work in a two month summer internship. So, uh, but we do. Uh, we were happy with part time. Uh, we have opportunities for time in our internal software development team. Uh, so please come to us if you would like to work part time. But uh, you know we hope you can also do part time work, if you, especially if you're a senior, uh, you know, level student or guided. Um, if you cannot work full time, please come to work for us part time. But it should be more than a month or two, right? And finally, uh, offline event, right? So uh, you know, Alexander, uh, I have yeah. already answered this question. Oh, yeah, answered the question. Messages. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. perfect. Okay, great. So uh, uh, so then with that, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, for attending the course. Uh, very happy that you are here. We hope that you also go to the next course, uh, and uh, we also hope that you apply for a job with us. Thank you.